Opeth with Incada Venenum, which translates from Latin into poison in the tail. Now, the poison in this tale for Opeth, at least over the past decade, has been a divided fan base due to the heavy prog era that the band is currently in. An era that began with Heritage, was able to go through Pale Communion and Sorceress, and could potentially be continued, there is that threat here on Incada Venenum. And this has been centered completely around the lack of growls on these albums from frontman Michael Akrofit. And we've seen the memes. The memes have been around for 10 years. There's probably one of the oldest memes that are out there for music, aside from maybe I Am The Table by Metallica, which has made its way to botchamania and conventional culture. You see the memes. You know the memes. No growling on album. Album bad. Steve Wilson stole Mike from us. Give Mike back. Miss Mike. Mike P's growl. XD rar. They're getting irritating at this point. It's been way too long. I mean, in eight years, this meme will probably be able to vote. Do you want this meme to vote in elections? Don't answer that question. But what does Incada Venom offer to us? Is this something where, based off of each previous album getting a little bit heavier, that this is going to be their heaviest heavy prog album yet? I know that sounds redundant, but it is something where the trend had been escalating toward it. So we need to examine this album and see exactly what we've gotten. Did we get the heavy prog album of our dreams? Or are we once again sodding along meme territory? Well, we start this album off with Garden of Earthly Delights. This is an intro that I feel goes on a little bit too long and also introduces something on this album that's a bit perplexing. And that's the addition of these little, you know, spoken word montages or these, you know, found footage style, uh, you know, recordings that seem like it's being taken from either children or a ritzy, you know, aristocratic party, almost like a, you know, real life version of Clue. It's something that's scattered throughout this album. It feels like it's very th uh, themologically uh, important considering some of the song titles and some of the lyricism, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. And it's something that does bog down this introductory track a bit. I feel like they could have done exactly what they did with this song in half the time. Not exactly the best start, but mm, let's move on. We know that Dignity and Heart in Hand are both fantastic tracks. These are ones that are exhibiting exactly what this album was going to be. It was going to have a heavy veneer to it that had some very catchy choruses, some very great layered overall rhythm that was going to give it a little bit of excessive oomph. And we also know that the undulating you know, style that Opeth has been known for forever of escalating from between heaviness and softness is still present. This is something that the heavy prog era of Opeth did not abandon from its previous versions whenever they were a progressive death metal band. They still have those rises and falls, but instead the range doesn't feel quite as vast. Instead it feels a little bit more natural and didn't exactly lend to the band's uniquity. That's something that progressive death metal always seemed to have over some other subgenres back in the late 1990s and early 2000s. That vast juxtaposition of style and that commitment to various styles of singing felt very new, very real, very different, and very challenging. So it did seem to lend to Opeth's overall veneer of excellence. But that's something that's still in the prog, you know, era of Opeth has been very well tailored and very well done, and Dignity and Heart and Hand both exhibit this. Going into Next Akin, we have another song that's able to exhibit this, and these tracks are also doing something a little different from previous heavy prog albums. They are examining with length. They're going between that uh, six and eight minute long mark. They're examining a little bit more of those uh, sort of blues-laden riffs and some strange prog patterns that have become very prominent within prog music for, you know, 40 years. And uh, the history books have shown that Mike's love of this style of music not only helped to usher in this era, but is something that he continues to study and continues to employ various styles into uh, the sounds that we hear on Opeth releases during this past decade. We even have a little juxtaposition on this album that feels a very much like a Beatles reference to, I believe, Here Comes the Sun was what I heard. But Next of Kin is a really good track with uh, it's seven minutes, but it pales in comparison to the midpoint point of this album, which is Love, Lorn, Crime, which just flat out goes into ballad territory, but also has a blues uh, solo near its conclusion that just absolutely crushes the soul. The build on this song is absolutely majestic. The way in which the soft voice that Mike employs is able to flow over this composition is something to really behold. 
And I think not since a, a song such as Burden off of Watershed have we heard a ver uh, such a vulnerable version of Mike. And as a result, it causes this track to feel way larger than what it actually is, and almost like it is just this lost son from a bygone era, that it belonged on an album such as Watershed, or even was a rejected idea from all the way back in the Damnation days. And the blues uh, riff at the end, that blues solo at the end, is just so soul-crushing. It almost causes tears to come to your eyes, and if you do feel a little waterworks, just let it flow, because this is an absolutely beautiful track. One of the best, I would say, if not the best, from this generation of Opeth. Now, moving on forward into Charlatan, this is where I get a little bit divisive, I think, from some conventional thought, because I felt that Charlatan was a bit of a bad follow-up to a song such as Love, Lorn, Crime. It does get into some weird areas and does have a lot of that heaviness that I think fans have been sort of longing for, but just it meets them halfway, and fans, you know, you give them an inch, they are going to want a mile. It's never going to be satisfactory to some of these folks. Charlatan just feels like a bit of a uh, empty follow-up that has a lot of edge to it, but doesn't feel like it has the same strength and power that was really gained through the first five tracks on this album, excluding Garden of Earthly Delights. I still really do enjoy this song, but felt like it was not the best or the best apt follow-up for a track such as Love, Lorne, Crime. Maybe that's just me nitpicking. It probably is. I tend to do that often. But getting into Universal Truth, we then get into some even stranger compositional territory, now borrowing a bit from classical composition as well as just almost going into experimental or even avant-garde territory, grabbing from bits and pieces of prog rock history, dating all the way back to the 1970s. I mean, Mike's admitted love for groups such as Van de Graaff Generator, as well as Blackwater Park and Still Life, which were band names before they were album titles, certainly shows themselves to be just really perfect. And Camel being another huge influence does make an influence whenever it comes to uh, some of the ways in which the guitars are able to mold and mend and bend. But the classical composition is what gives uh, Universal Truth its real strange power, considering you're not quite sure where this is going to go next. And throughout its runtime, you just feel very transfixed by this. You're unsure of what's going to happen, and as a result, you love what you hear. Going into the Garreter and even in the Continuum, we have a pair of tracks that do sort of follow that same formula a little bit, however, do make necessary adjustments. The Garreter does have a little bit more of an edge to it, but whenever it comes to um, Continuum, that we're sort of diving and bombing right back into that heavy prog. And within that, we are getting a strange dose of a simulacrum. We have songs that are staying within the same box, you know, treading within the same envelope, but still feel like they have enough necessary uniqueness to feel individual. And based off of that, each one feels like it has its own score or grade that's valued to it, with the Garreter being a little bit weaker than what Continuum was able to offer. But both tracks do feel like they have a great sense of purpose exactly where they are on this disc. Some may even argue that Continuum would have been a more apt finale, and I would completely disagree with that. But I can understand where they come from, considering it does have some of the tailor-made, you know, landmark, you know, uh, moments that feel uh, just like a track that is setting up the end of an album. But the end instead is what we get is All Things Will Pass. And this eight minute, 33 second long song certainly pulls no punches. It really picks up exactly where Continuum left off, making these two feel very companion related. And as a result, it tells a very sad story that definitely reaches its most heart-wrenching conclusion at its ending, which makes sense, obviously. The transition and changeover in sound from the four minute mark onward feels very much like the Opeth days of old, where they are using some of the greatest aspects of their previous uh, or, uh, incarnation in order to really craft bliss. You have something that has a, an elongated build that feels like it has a little bit more oomph and girth, maybe a little bit more angst that is boiled behind it, but then it transitions into its more heart-wrenching um, final moments. And the riff that you get behind the very final lyrics of this album, If Everything Ends, Is It Worth To Go Back Home Again?, is so incredibly simple, but it is the most moving and heart-wrenching that I have heard perhaps since, once again, Burden, way back on Watershed. And that's something that this album was able to do, at least for me, 
that hasn't been done on Heritage or Pale Communion or Sorceress. This was an album that channeled my emotional capacity. It was something that tapped in to that reservoir and caused a little bit of water to form right underneath my eyes. It's the one thing that Incauta Venom was somehow able to do. The poison in the tail was able to sting me and bring me to its emotional depth, but was unable to do that throughout its whole experience. And that perhaps may be the most glaring criticism that I have for it, is that this is an album that does have a lot of great experimentation on it. This is a disc that does so much in order to factor in all of Opeth's various sides throughout their heavy prog generation while also adding new tricks to the trade. This is a band that's not resting on their laurels and instead feels the need to continue to add new dynamics and new layers to a sound that was already rapidly developing to maturity. And as a result, this feels like the most mature effort, but also one that has a lot of the mistakes of transitioning from an adolescent into an adult. Feeling like you have to do a little bit more than you actually have to. Some of the experiments work, others feel a little bit like they sort of swung and missed. I'm still not totally certain about all of these sort of like found footage, you know, voices that we hear. It's an interesting aspect. It does kind of give that very highbrow, almost monocle meme style event that, again, I reference to a Game of Clue, because I always thought that that was, you know, some aristocratic party gone wrong, and then all of a sudden everybody put their little Sherlock Holmes caps on and decided, fuck, we need to solve a mystery. Come on, Scoob! But this is still a disc that does do a lot of things right, and I do enjoy the fact that they are getting back and tapping into that emotional capacity that they were able to bring out despite their previous, the previous version of this band having a most markedly heavier edge. As a result, In Caught a Venom by Opeth to me is a 24 out of 30, and it was very nearly a 25, but after listening to it a couple of more times, I'm settling with the 24 score, and I feel very confident with it. This is an album that does, like I said, a ton of things correct, but does have a couple of perplexing things uh, that are going on with it. Some of these tracks do go on a little longer than previously expected and it doesn't feel, it, it kind of suffers from some of the problems that we've talked about in a couple previous reviews like the Slipknot review where some of that length feels a bit artificially manufactured as opposed to feeling like it was a necessary evil for the track and uh, Dream Theater's epic from earlier this year's Distance Over Time is another song that suffers from this fate. Uh, but as a result, the experimentation, though, is a very large high point on this album, and tracks such as Love, Lord, and Crime and All Things Will Pass that tap into that emotional register is something that feels very brand new, once again, for this band. Considering the previous albums tended to try to do this by using some emotional style prog, but seemed to always miss the mark just by a little bit. They were songs that had a lot of great uh, moments that were included, a lot of addictive riffs, However, they just didn't quite hit that emotional depth that we were able to achieve on two tracks here on In uh, Caught a Venom. But I want to know what you guys think about this album. Please let me know in the comments below. Subscribe and hit that bell button so you know of each review that is coming. My name is Cover Killer Nation, and I'll talk to you guys next time. Take care.